we make the rules, and then the rules make us. The present is a direct result of the actions and the policies that we developed in the past, and the future will be shaped by the policies that we design today. When I was preparing for this talk, I was reminded of an observation by Albert Einstein. And he once said, perfection of means and confusion of ends seems to characterize our age. And I think that observation is as right today as it was when he uttered it half a century ago. Again and again, we, we design public policies that defy our values and our ends. The rules we make, from local zoning ordinances to national tax policy, from public spending to trade agreements, value mobility over community. They value competition over cooperation. They value inequality over equality. They value absentee ownership over local ownership. They value selling abroad over selling to our neighbors. And they value doing well over doing good. From the micro to the macro level, we make policies that undermine our sense of community. I live in a lovely neighborhood in Minneapolis, halfway up a modest hill. And a short time before I moved in, several accidents had occurred at the bottom of the hill. And apparently over the years, the people who lived on both sides of my residential street had become frustrated because commuters had begun to use my residential neighborhood as a shortcut as the main arteries, the main streets, had become congested by traffic. Now, my neighbors are all well-versed in the ways of local and state politics, and they urged the city to install a stop sign, a relatively trivial request, you would think. But it was years before the city would honor that request, and they then discovered what any good neighborhood activist around the country already knows, and that is that the city engineer and the city planner have as their number one priority to enable a car or a truck to quickly move from one side of the metropolitan area to the other. That's their job. And neighborhoods who view their streets as something other than simple thoroughfares are viewed as parochial and obstructionist to the greater good. Indeed, my city has adopted rules that make it very difficult for a neighborhood to have any control over its streets at all. For example, we have this rule. No stop sign can be installed until at least three traffic accidents have occurred at that intersection. From the local to the global, mobility takes precedence over community. In the last few months, in the last six months, we have seen the devastating impact of uncontrolled financial flows on the Asian economies. They've been battered by currency speculators and investors driven by short-term considerations. We've learned that the tidal wave of money that sloshes through the global economy wreaks havoc twice. Once when the wave crashes on the shore and the second time when it recedes. The dominance of currency speculation is a very recent phenomenon. Currency exchange, of course, has occurred for hundreds and perhaps thousands of years. And for almost all of those years, Currency exchange greased, enabled the real economy. As recently as 1970, 98% of all currency exchanges took place to promote the real economy. Tourism, foreign investment and aid, and trade. But then in the early 1970s, we changed the rules. And we allowed currencies to float, and we allowed capital to roam. And the result was an increasing spiral of speculation such that today, Almost 98% of all currency exchanges are for speculative purposes. More currency is exchanged in one week than the value of trade that occurs over an entire year. And this movement of money, which is increasingly a movement of electrons, does nothing to expand or bolster the real economy, but it does deeply affect the structure and the soundness of that economy. Now, one would think that given the prima facie evidence of the dangers of unfettered capital flows in Asia, that our policymakers would begin to design rules to curb speculative capital. Instead, they are proposing more of the same. The bailout plan by the IMF requires Asian governments to open their economies to even more speculation. In the middle of the Asian crisis, more than 100 nations proudly signed a new trade agreement that allows foreign investors enhanced ability to buy and sell the assets of other nations. And the IMF is meeting this month 
to change its articles of incorporation such that every member of the IMF must change, must change its own internal rules and eliminate any last controls that it has over capital flows. So whether it's a stop sign in a neighborhood or a stop sign on the global financial highway, our policymakers are clear. Means, not ends, drives their policies. To them, success is measured, is measured in the number of miles a resource moves. The greater the distance, the better. The central feature, the central characteristic of modern industrial economies is, I believe, separation. We've designed policies that separate the producer from the consumer, the farmer from the kitchen, the power plant from the appliance, the worker from the workplace, the employer from the employee, the banker from the depositor and the borrower, and of course, ultimately, the government from its citizens. I, I hadn't realized how far we had gone in that direction until a, a couple of years ago, I was eating out, and as is my want, when I finished eating, I went up to the cash register, and I, and I got a toothpick, and I noticed that the toothpick was, was wrapped in plastic, and on the plastic was the word Japan. Now, Japan has no oil, and Japan has very little wood, and yet it was deemed efficient to send a bunch of oil and a bunch of wood to Japan, wrap the one and the other, and then send them back to St. Paul so I could clean my teeth uh, after my lunch. Now, I calculate that, the, that, the, uh, that toothpick had embodied in it about 50,000 miles in transportation. Now, I know that PhD um, economists can explain how efficient that is, but common sense tells us that there's another way. A few years ago, Minnesota decided to retaliate. The governor vigorously promoted a factory in the northern part of the state that would manufacture disposal, disposable chopsticks for the Japanese in the northern part of Minnesota. So in my mind's eye, I see these two ships passing one another in the North Pacific. One loaded with little pieces of wood going from Minnesota to Japan, and one loaded with little pieces of wood going from Japan to Minnesota. That's the nature of the modern economy, and we call it efficient. We've separated authority from responsibility. We've separated those who make the decisions from those who feel the impact of those decisions. And the result is poor decisions and an apathetic, alienated, and increasingly embittered citizenry. We live in an era in which politicians of every ideological stripe and hue love to gargle with the word community. But the policies they implement make it more and more difficult for us to have strong geographical communities. We live in an era in which the highest good is to shop, and yet we refuse to accept responsibility for our shopping habits. Consider the issue of nuclear waste. Nuclear waste was a hard sell. It took the federal government 20 years to convince this country to accept nuclear waste. 40 years ago, the US government tried to promote nuclear power to a very suspicious and concerned public. After all, we had seen the results of nuclear testing. We had heard about the dangers of radiation. And so to close the deal, the federal government promised communities in which nuclear plants were located that they would never have to be responsible for the nuclear waste generated in the process of supplying them electricity. Well, it's now almost 30 years after the first nuclear reactor went into operation. And a few years ago, the radioactive wastes, the spent fuel rods, uh, had begun to exceed the on-site carrying capacity of those nuclear reactors. They had to figure out another dump site. Now, the federal government is now controlled by conservative, personality, re personal responsibility-loving Republicans, and they were faced with a difficult choice. They could, of course, tell the citizens of the 40 states in which nuclear reactors are based that they would, in fact, have to accept responsibility for their electric wastes. But if they did so, it was highly likely that those citizens would quickly vote to phase out their nuclear reactors. And so rather than face that prospect, Congress is now debating a bill that would dump the nation's radioactive wastes in one state, Nevada. Despite the opposition of over 80% of the population of Nevada, and beside, despite the fact that Nevada is one of the few states that has no nuclear reactors and probably consumes no electricity 
that's generated by a nuclear reactor. When we separate those who make the decisions from those who feel the impact of those decisions, when we separate authority from responsibility, when we separate the producer from the consumer from the waste disposal site, we're looking for trouble. Today, if you take an economics class, you learn three so-called scientific truths, and in fact, they call them scientific truths, and those in this audience who are really scientists might wonder about that. First, that free trade promotes domestic prosperity. Second, that larger production and economic enterprises are better and more efficient. Third, that exports are superior and benefit us more than selling to our neighbors. Well, all three are not, not truths at all. They're value-laden conclusions. They're almost ideologically-laden conclusions. All three are contestable. All three undermine a sense of place and community. The free trade and prosperity link is remarkably tenuous. History is replete with examples of nations that prospered by favoring their own industries and of nations that faltered when they opened their doors to unfettered trade. Indeed, when Britain, the most powerful nation by far in the world in the mid-19th century, when Britain adopted a free trade regime, its economy began to decline. And by World War I, it was no longer a dominant power. On the other hand, the greatest increase in productivity, in innovation, and prosperity occurred in the nation that had the highest tariffs in the world, ours, the United States, at the end of the 19th century. And in the 20th century, the most rapid economic growth has occurred in those nations which protected their own businesses. The bigger is better link is equally unsupportable. Humanly scaled systems are the most efficient and economical. The family farm is the most productive way to raise food. The employee-owned firm is the most profitable form of business enterprise. The neighborhood school is the most effective way to educate our children. Neighborhood team policing, where the police walk the neighborhood and become familiar with its culture and its customs, is the best way to prevent crime. Small businesses generate more jobs and have more innovation than big businesses. Local governments are more responsive and thrifty than national governments. Compact communities are less costly to build and operate than sprawling cities. I could go on and on and on. The empirical evidence is compatible and consistent with what we really want, which is humanly scaled systems. We know those truths to be self-evident, and yet the conventional wisdom continues that economies of scale inhabit all sectors. And so we change the rules to encourage giantism. Consider what's happened in the financial services sector just the last few weeks. The announced marriage of Travelers Group and Citicorp and the waves of mega mergers that it inspired puts size, scale, bigness directly in the public spotlight. And the empirical evidence on this issue points to a very clear conclusion. Size does matter but not in the way that the proponents of giantism would have it. Alan Abelson of Barron's Business Journal sums up the situation very nicely, and I quote, if size equaled success, then the Deutsche Bank and the Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi would be eating Wall Street's lunch. They're not. When Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan opens wide the door to giantism, he's ignoring the findings of his own institution. The president of the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank is more forthright. He says, and I quote, once a bank is larger than $400 million in deposits, economies of scale appear to be exhausted. An in-depth study by two other Federal Reserve economists concluded, and I quote, small banks generally perform as well or better than large banks. And we should reflect on the fact that in 1990, more than 11,000 of the 12,000 banks in the United States were small, with assets under $300 million. The proposed Citigroup, on the other hand, would have assets over $700 billion. Large banks like to do business 
with large corporations. That's why, according to the Federal Reserve, 90% of all loans to small businesses are made by small banks. Large banks are less responsive to households. That's why, as the U.S. Public Interest Research Group pointed out a couple of weeks ago, big banks impose higher fees on their customers than small banks or credit unions. So the benefit of giant banks is trivial or non-existent. But the potential harm of allowing these kinds of concentrations is by no means trivial. Separating banks from their communities is a very costly proposition. Some 15 years ago, Congress severed the link between money and community in the savings and loan industry. And the tab for that error in judgment has already reached $150 billion. But I submit to you that the potential economic harm from bank giantism pales into insignificance before its adverse impact on the nature of our democracy. It was Thomas Jefferson who wisely observed, and I quote, banks are more dangerous than standing armies. Concentrated power breeds arrogance. What else would you call it when a few days after Congress, for the dozenth, dozenth time, failed to make it legal for insurance companies and banks to merge? Just a few days later, the CEOs of Travelers and Citicorp announced that they would ignore Congress and illegally go right ahead. Did our national legislators stand up and tell CEO Sandy Weil and John Reed that they would not be cowed? Hardly. They scrambled to put the rejected bill back on the legislative agenda. By separating those who make the decisions from those who feel the impact of those decisions, we end up with very costly decisions which may enrich a few but destabilize and demoralize the many. But enough of my telling you about our present dismal situation. Let me turn to a more positive and sanguine perspective. What can we do about it? Given our yearning for humanly scaled systems, what kinds of rules might we adopt that would channel scientific ingenuity and entrepreneurial energies and investment capital in a direction that makes the ends, uh, that makes us move toward the ends that we want to achieve. What might these new rules be? Well, let me offer you a few for your consideration. In the environmental sector, back in 1970, Congress passed the Clean Air Act. Part of that law was intended to reduce smokestack pollution. The regulations required industries to raise the height of their smokestacks. The reigning principle of the day was Dilution is the solution to pollution. Hmm? And the result? Well, the result we should have foreseen. The result was that a local particulate problem was transformed into a regional and even an international acid rain problem. Well, what if Congress and the regulating agencies had instead been guided by our first principle, marry authority and responsibility? They might have asked industry not to raise the height of their smokestacks, but to lower them to curve the ends and put the ends into the window of the executive suite. <laughs> and I assure you that if they had done that, design engineers would have invented and created zero emission factories 25 years ago. By forcing those who make the decisions to be those who feel the impact of those decisions, we encourage better decisions. In the business sector, the application of this principle means encouraging more rooted forms of business, cooperatives, municipally owned utilities, employee owned firms, and the like. When a plant is locally owned, especially when it is owned by its employees or its suppliers, a different economic calculus is at work. The absentee shareholder, whose investment is usually temporary, seeks to maximize his or her return. Indeed, under US law, under state law, under New York, Law, a corporation's management must strive to maximize the return to its shareholders over and above any other consideration. The absentee-owned corporation will close down factories even when they're profitable if they can earn a higher return elsewhere. It happens every day in some community. Last year it happened to Lima, Ohio. British Petroleum decided to close its 119-year-old refinery the refinery wasn't losing money, just the opposite. 
It made more than $40 million in profits in 1996, but British Petroleum felt it could use the assets better in another location. And so the good citizens of Lima organized to find buyers of this refinery. Four submitted bids. Three of the four had very deep pockets and many years' experience in the industry. They clearly could have kept the refinery open. But British Petroleum rejected all offers and decided instead to scrap it. In the United States, they had the legal right to do that. But in several European countries, they wouldn't have the right to close a profitable operation when there was a local bid to keep it open. We made the rules, and Lima, Ohio, is feeling the pain. Employee-owned firms make a decision based on a very different cost-benefit calculus. They, too, operate in an increasingly brutal competitive marketplace. If their firms can't compete, then they go under. But when a decision is made about whether to relocate the firm or whether to ask for tax breaks from the local government, the employee-owned firm takes into account the impact on their jobs, on their community, and on the tax base that pays for the schooling and services for their families. Rooted businesses make different decisions than mobile firms. Consider the case of North Dakota's cooperatively owned pasta plant from Durham Wheat and the North American Free Trade Agreement. North Dakota's plant is owned by hundreds of Durham Wheat farmers. And when NAFTA was up for ratification, that company, that plant, was the only pasta processor on either side of the border to oppose NAFTA. All the other processors wanted NAFTA because it would lower their raw material costs. But in North Dakota, those who raised the raw material also owned the processing plant, and they had no interest in depressing the price of wheat so long as every one of their competitors had to pay the same fair price. What rules might encourage more rooted economies? Let me suggest a few. One we already have on the books. It dates back to 1974. And it's a tax incentive for employers who would make their employees owners of their firms. This tax change has opened wide the door to employee ownership. And today, employee stock ownership plans are on over 10,000 companies. And in over 1,000, the employees have a majority of the stock. We have a rule and it has encouraged a more rooted, locally owned economy. Not a less effective, not a less innovative, not a less productive, but a more rooted economy. Well, a number of cities and counties are beginning to develop rules that curb uneconomic bigness. The most sophisticated may be Vermont, which passed legislation in the middle 1970s called Act 250. And Act 250 establishes a citizens commission to review large scale, which is defined as over 10 acres, developments. The law requires an environmental impact statement, which is very common, but it goes further. It requires an economic impact statement as well. When Walmart tried to open a large store in Vermont, the commission rejected the application. After it did some research and evaluation and concluded that Walmart would cost the community $3 for every $1 in benefits it created. The prices were a little cheaper at Walmart's, but it would have taken businesses, uh, sales, away from other local businesses. And Vermont decided that preserving the diversity of businesses, preserving the connection between business and community was more important than saving a few pennies on some underwear. And Walmart then took Vermont to court. And it argued that a community can't deny a giant store a permit simply because it's a giant and would adversely affect other businesses in that area. A few months ago, the Vermont Supreme Court affirmed Vermont's right to establish those kinds of rules that protect and nurture strong communities. Back in the 1920s, a movement arose in the United States to impose the social costs on a then pretty new phenomenon in the retail sector, the chain store. States began to impose a progressive tax on chain stores, a tax that increased depending on the number of branches that a chain owned. As the branches multiplied, the owner of the store 
the legislators felt, became more remote from the customer and began to aggregate, to concentrate economic and eventually political power that could begin to threaten communities. The states didn't ban branch stores. Instead, they imposed a sometimes quite stiff tax on these stores. Oregon and New Jersey are the only two states in the country that ban self-service gas stations. And I could see, by the look in your eyes, able-bodied student population looking to save a few bucks. That's somehow un-American. Well, what Oregon concluded was that when you allow self-service gas stations, then if you have a full-service gas pump, the price of gas at that gas pump is 20, 30, 40, even 50 cents higher. And who is it that goes to the full service gas pump? Not the millionaires, the lame, the halt, the fearful, and the elderly. The ones that are afraid of getting out of their car or they can't. And why do we burden them with that exceedingly high price? That's why they passed the law, but then they found out that actually that law also enabled and preserved locally owned businesses. It preserved mechanics. It preserved service stations where you actually got service. And they found out that the price of gasoline in Oregon is no higher than the price of gasoline in Washington, which does permit self-service gas stations. We make the rules, and then the rules shape and define our communities. We need not only to root our communities and our economies in a sense of place, but whenever possible, we need to encourage the decentralization of productive capacity. And here I again echo the thoughts of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson believed that sustainable democracies depended on the widest distribution of property. In our day, property means a bank account, a house, a car, a toaster. But Jefferson's concept of property was much more substantial. To him, property meant productive capacity. It meant the capacity for self-reliance. In his day, that meant having a farm, having the skills to manage a farm, and having the tools to make a farm productive. Indeed, Thomas Jefferson thought that without a strong yeomanry, democracy itself would fail. Because a yeoman farmer produced real wealth, and in the production of real wealth could participate in the political decision-making process with that experience and that knowledge. That is, he or she wouldn't be hoodwinked by politicians. He or she would understand the relationship of the rules to the generation of real wealth. And because the yeoman farmer was propertied in this sense, was capable of self-reliance, he or she would be more impervious, less vulnerable to boss machines, to political parties that, in effect, would buy him off. And in the 19th century, of course, graft and corruption between the elected and the electors was very common. Well, I think Thomas Jefferson has been proven correct. We have shifted from a nation of self-reliant and multi-skilled farmers to a nation of semi-skilled pushers of paper that own no property. And as a result, the connection between the citizenry and the political process has now gone askew. It's very difficult for us to figure out how to make decisions because we're no longer rooted and we're no longer capable of self-reliance. Well, I'm not suggesting that we all go back to the farm. What I am suggesting is that we begin to use our human ingenuity and our scientific capacity to begin to recreate technologies that are decentralized in their application and in their function. Now, one could make a reasonable argument that at the end of the 19th century, technological developments demanded the centralization of productive capacity and inevitably absentee ownership. When we shifted from energy sources like wind and water to concentrated fuel sources like coal and oil, when we switched from wood to steel, 
When we switched from batch manufacturing to mass manufacturing and mass production, we inevitably shifted from little to big, from local to national and international. But at the end of the 20th century, at the dawn of the 21st century, I would argue to you, the technological dynamic is much less centripetal than it is centrifugal. It lends itself to a genuine democratization of productive capacity, if we make the rules that channel ingenuity in that direction. Let me argue the case by touching on a few kinds of technology, one a product and another a process. One is in the energy field. Back in the early 1950s, President Truman established a commission to look at the future of materials and in their examination of the future of materials, they looked at the future of energy and the future of fuel and the future of electricity. And they had a choice back in the early 1950s. They could have chosen two completely different technologies in implication as well as in structure. One was nuclear power, which was untried as a commercial power source in the early 1950s and had considerable challenges before it. And the other was the photovoltaic electric cell or solar cell, the concept of which had been invented a number of years before, but it also was untried in commercial applications. But we know what the, which one they chose. And they put several hundred billion dollars and huge numbers of incentives, one of which I talked about earlier in this lecture, to enable nuclear power to become a very significant part of our electric power supply. But solar cells continued to develop. In the middle 1950s, they began to be used uh, for pilot applications. And in the 1960s, they began to be used in orbiting satellite systems. They were thousands of times more expensive than competing electrical sources in the 1960s. But there wasn't any alternative. I mean, well, actually, there was. The alternative would have been the longest extension cord uh, in history. Um, so the fact that they cost an enormous amount per kilowatt hour generated didn't matter. And they continued to fuel our satellites where the sun shines 24 hours a day until the early 1980s uh, when the, the Pentagon discovered uh, a much more, they thought, um, benign energy source than the sun. And so now uh, all of our satellites are, um, and probes uh, are powered by plutonium. In the early 1970s, solar cells came down to Earth, and they were used for terrestrial applications. It seems to me that in the energy field, we are now reversing the trend of a century ago. We are now shifting from fossil fuels to renewable fuels. The process will take decades, but the end result is already clear. We're shifting away from a fuel source, which is located in a few highly concentrated deposits, like the Middle East, to fuel sources that are widely distributed. The most decentralizing of all fuel sources, of course, is sunlight. And the solar cell converts the sun into, or uses the sun to generate electricity. I said that solar cells came down to Earth in the middle 1970s, and they immediately found a market. Remote villages, mountaintop radio repeater stations, ocean buoy systems, and the like. They were attractive because they have no moving parts. The companies will guarantee them for 20 or 30 years. They require no, or virtually no, maintenance. Therefore, they were competitive for certain applications from the very first day that they were for sale. In the 1980s and in the 1990s, the price of solar cells dropped by more than 90%. And today, solar cells, while still not competitive with conventional electricity, are attractive enough that several utilities now encourage their customers, who are more than a few hundred yards off the existing grid system, to use solar cells rather than pay to have a new line laid in. Several commercial companies are now designing solar cells that are overlays of roof shingles and building siding. They envision the time, not very far away, when the building itself generates its own power. In Sacramento, California, they're putting solar cell canopies over parking lots. 
which are increasingly populated by electric vehicles. Consider that sufficient sunlight falls on our buildings each day, even in Rochester, to provide all the energy needed by an efficient building and its appliances with enough left over to fuel the family electric car. Right now, sunlight in our buildings is usually a burden because sunlight falls on a black roof, warms up the building, and requires us to use more air conditioning. We need to focus our ingenuity on extracting value from an otherwise wasted resource which would allow us to begin to uncouple from the utility, or more likely would begin to allow us to transform ourselves into what Alvin Toffler, who wrote a book called The Third Wave, uh, uh, called prosumers. He said that in the future we would be both consumers and producers. In the future, our solar cell roofs would not make us self-sufficient, but they would make us self-reliant. We would sell and buy our electricity from the local electricity grid system in the same way that utilities now that are nuclear powered or coal fired powered now buy and sell their electricity from the regional and increasingly national transmission system. The solar cell is a form of productive capacity. The manufacture of the solar cell will, of course, not be done at the household level. But new technologies make it possible for us to think about decentralizing manufacturing technologies as well. Consider what's happened in just the last 15 years in the publishing industry. In 1984, Apple Computer introduced its laser jet printer, and desktop publishing was born. The first laser jets were slow, and the printouts were not typeset quality. But today, for less than $10,000, you can buy a laser jet that prints out more than 20 typeset quality pages a minute. And there are similar improvements in the scale and the speed of book binding. And what does all that mean? Well, let's imagine what book publishing could look like in the next few years. As the author of four books, let me tell you a little bit about how the process of publication operates now. The author sends the manuscript to a publisher who then typesets it and sends it to a printer who sends it to a binder who sends the bound book to a trucker who delivers it to a warehouse who sends it to the retail store and if there's insufficient demand, the retail store sends it to the garbage dump or the recycling pulp mill many intermediaries in this process. In the not so distant future, the production process could look entirely different. The author will still produce the work, but then he or she will send it into cyberspace where it awaits retrieval. There won't be any intermediate printers, no truckers, no warehouses, or perhaps even publishers, and the final customer will still enter a bookstore and still search a book and search for a book. And the bookstore, probably, connecting with the customer, knowing the customer's tastes over a number of months or years, might have one copy of the books they think people would be interested in on their shelves. And so you can browse on the shelves tactically, or you can browse in the computer. And eventually, uh, when you make your choice, uh, the store owner will ask you to sit down, have a cup of coffee, and in five minutes or 10 minutes, they'll print out a book if you want. Large typeface, give you a large typeface. You want small typeface, you get small typeface. So the retail store will become a manufacturing facility. The price of those books will probably be about the same as today, but the money will be divided up very differently. The authors would receive two or even three times what they now receive in royalties per book. The retail store come printer will receive more than half the retail price, and the information company will earn a small amount for storage and retrieval. From an environmental and economic standpoint, the system is remarkably efficient. Books are printed only when somebody wants them. No need for inventory space, no remainders, and no waste. And from a social perspective, that system begins to rebuild communities by re-energizing independent bookstores. Big chains and superstores have three advantages over smaller stores. They boast a wider selection, they purchase in larger volumes, and therefore they can undercut the book price offered by independents, and they have a large centralized advertising budget. 
but the information storage technology of the future allows for no scale economies. The shopper in the small bookstore will be able to access the same dizzying selection of books as the shopper in the mega chain, and more important to the browser will be the selective taste of the bookstore owner. The potential for desktop publishing and the laser jet printer and binders to add a manufacturing component to your local retail store is relatively easy to imagine. Less easy to imagine for most audiences, but probably not so hard for this audience, is the use of laser technology for another purpose. There are several processes that can use laser technology to move us toward desktop manufacturing and not just publishing. One of those is stereolithography. Some people call it three-dimensional faxing. In desktop publishing, a beam of light moves back and forth rapidly across paper. In stereolithography, a beam of light moves back and forth across a three-dimensional screen, wired screen, that rises out of a vat of plastic. And as the beam of light hits the plastic, it hardens it and slowly forms a three-dimensional hard shape. Stereolithography is already used in industry. It's used now primarily for making models. It's used by designers. It's used in the medical establishment as well. And soon it might be used for making structural three-dimensional shapes. The Navy is now exploring the possibility of having such a manufacturing unit on board its ships at sea so that if it needs one replacement part, it can manufacture it aboard. One can imagine neighborhood retail stores being able to manufacture simple products in this fashion in the near future. And then, of course, there's the internet and the web. And I don't think I need to discuss that remarkable advance to this audience. The most attractive aspect of the web to me is that it is a horizontal system. It is a system that allows individuals to communicate directly to other individuals and allows individuals to be producers and sell their goods directly to other individuals. When, in the next 10 years, instant translation occurs and verbal recognition improves, we can expect that people with different languages and different cultures will be able for the first time in human history to speak directly to one another over a distance, seeing one another on life-size screens. And so we will begin to have a cultural exchange, not from the top down, not from Ted Turner to us, not from Rupert Murdoch to us, but from us to us, an extraordinary development in the human species. Our astonishing ability to manipulate matter is leading us toward what I call a dual economy. The information economy will be worldwide, for it will soon be as inexpensive to send an idea across the planet as it is to send it down the street. But the physical economy of manufacturing and transport and retail will be localized and regionalized. We will have a global village, and we will have a globe of villages. We will import a good idea from anywhere, but we will increasingly satisfy our material needs from local resources. So the globalists are not entirely wrong. We are moving into a global economy. Where they make their mistake is to assume that globalization should invade every part of our lives. I began this talk with a quote from one of the world's great 20th century scientists, Albert Einstein. Let me end it with a quote from one of the world's great 18th century scientists, Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was many things. He was an inventor, he was a diplomat, he was an entrepreneur, he was a revolutionary, he was an author. He married the private and the public in a way that very few did before or after. He was the inventor of the lightning rod, the inventor of bifocals, the inventor of the energy efficient wood stove, and the rocking chair, and a scientist of the first order when his uh, paper uh, was published on the nature of electricity. We all know Benjamin Franklin as that somewhat crazy guy who flew a kite uh, in a storm uh, in order to examine uh, lightning. Well, he, with a key at the end of it, right? That's right. Well, of course, Benjamin Franklin never did such a thing, but he did know and understand the nature of lightning to the point where he did invent something very, very common and very, very practical, which is the lightning rod uh, that has saved many a home 
uh, around the world. He was practical and he was visionary. He was an entrepreneur of the first order. He financed many of the first printing plants uh, in the United States, uh, and so he was a capitalist and an investor. He was an inventor of many forms of social enterprise. The volunteer fire department was invented by Benjamin Franklin. The free lending library was invented by Benjamin Franklin. Some might say that the United States of America was invented by Benjamin Franklin. But he's perhaps best known, and was best known in his era, as the author of Poor Richard's Almanac, a book of folk wisdom that became a bestseller. And the book contained many of Franklin's favorite aphorisms and insights. And the one that I think is consistent with this talk and with my thesis is the following. The man who would trade independence for security usually deserves to wind up with neither. We have made that trade and we have ended up both dependent and insecure. The evidence is all around us. Humanly scaled systems are more effective, they are more popular, they are more sustainable, and they are possible if we make rules that channel our ingenuity and our entrepreneurial spirit in the direction of creating such systems. It's time for us to make such rules. Thank you very much. How do you go about convincing a local government to change the policy of trying to lure in big business? Well, it's a, it's a, a pertinent central question. How, how, do you, uh, how do you convince a, a local government to stop its, uh, its focus on trying to lure um, big, uh, you know, big business? I mean, in some ways, it's uh, you know, how do you stop people from smoking and how do you stop people from eating too much? Uh, but Local governments over the last at least 10 years and maybe 15 years have in fact learned for themselves. They have. Local governments right now increasingly are trying to nurture businesses from within rather than attract businesses from without. They understand that even if they can get a business from outside of the area, they pay a very high price to do so. They pay a high price in foregone taxes. They pay a high price in, uh, in subsidies and incentives to that business. And if they are able to attract a very large business to their area, that business then becomes a substantial political influence in that area. And almost invariably, within 10 or 15 years, maybe 20 years, that business leaves the area because a mobile business is mobile. And so if you are able to attract a business from outside, it's because it has no connection to your community. And if it finds a better place to harvest its gains, it will do it someplace else. So in many places in this country now, local governments are trying to nurture local inventors, to nurture small businesses, to nurture um, small manufacturing, and trying, and trying to provide uh, incentives for them. On the other hand, it's hard to stop competing when the prize seems so grand. And so when BMW or Mercedes or General Motors or Intel says, we are shopping, I love their terms. This is their terminal. We are shopping for a community. We are buyers. Well, we are buyers. What do you got to sell? What do you got to offer? It's kind of hard not to put in an offer, you know? They're offering you several thousand jobs, high-paying jobs, well-paying jobs. They're offering you a research and development complex. And, you know, why not? But what you find is that one out of 100 communities wins that proposition, and the other 99 communities still have to nurture and develop their internal structure. You find that in those communities that are profitable over a 20, 30, 40 year period in this country and in other countries, it's because they nurtured their own. And over a 20 and 30 year period, they in fact created major uh, industries internal to themselves. I come from Minneapolis and Minnesota was known for many years as a place that grew its own. It was a homegrown economy. 
control data was homegrown. Uh, General Foods was homegrown. Uh, many of the, of the businesses uh, in Minnesota were grown uh, at home. So I think that the way that you convince local governments is to connect them to other local governments who have found a different way. I come from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and we've been working for 25 years to try to convince local governments, among others, uh, that small business uh, is better and that local business is better even when it's uh, big. Uh, and in the 70s and the 80s, uh, it was a tough haul. It was a real challenge. They were smokestack chasing. But in the 1990s, uh, we found it to be much easier. And we can connect your local government uh, officials to dozens and hundreds of others around the country who can, in fact, teach them from their own experience. And I think that your own experience here in Rochester is about as positive a case uh, as you can have. It's the best instance uh, of a case where um, you thought you had it all, uh, and then uh, the external economy changed and you found yourselves dependent. Uh, yes, um, as I understand it, the GATT treaty, uh, the ramifications aren't completely known yet, but as I understand it, uh, regulations that favor local autonomy, like the uh, Vermont Act 250 that you mentioned, may be in jeopardy uh, under GATT rules, and which uh, leads me to the larger question of even if the technology uh, is, in, is possible that would create uh, uh, lo a local economy or rooted economy, isn't there, aren't there incredible vested interests that, that, uh, that go against that? Well, the question, I mean, there were several questions there. One was vested interest and one was the rules, the, the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariff uh, and Trade. Yes, we are creating international rules which will limit our ability to make decisions that favor ourselves and protect ourselves. That's what the World Trade Organization was set up to do. That's what the proposed multilateral agreement on investments uh, is supposed to do. That's what NAFTA does, uh, and that's what GATT does. They don't do it completely, but they do it in some large respect. But we live in a country where we already are operating under such rules internal to ourselves. The U.S. Constitution created a free trade zone from Maine to California. And the Interstate Commerce Clause, which is a part of the Constitution, said you cannot favor your own. So we may worry about what's going to happen with international trade agreements, but what we really need to think about is the rules that we've created internal to ourselves. Now, I think that for many of of you in the audience, this sounds a little, well, it's a little esoteric here. It's a little arcane. What are we talking about? Well, let me give you an example. North Dakota tried to impose a sales tax on mail order firms. They weren't discriminating against mail order firms. They were imposing the same sales tax as they would impose if you bought that dress or good from a local store in North Dakota. They were imposing the same sales tax if you bought it from Land's End. Now, is that reasonable? Is that even-handed? It's not discriminating in favor of your own. It is simply trying to level the playing field between your local businesses and out-of-state businesses. And the Supreme Court said that was unconstitutional. It is unconstitutional, according to the US Constitution, to treat absentee businesses the same as local businesses. You can treat them better, but you can't treat them the same. And of course, don't even think of treating your local businesses better than absentee businesses. That's mail order firms. Mail order firms now sell about 80 to 100 billion dollars. And you ain't seen nothing yet because what's coming up? Internet firms. Hmm? And some people think that internet commerce can be a trillion dollars within 15 years. And the Supreme Court says that your local government and your state governments cannot impose the same sales taxes on one as on another. Well, 49% of all state revenue in this country comes from sales taxes. So if the future of the economy is in the internet, then how are we going to pay for our services and our schools in the next 10 and 15 years? So the question is about GATT. And I throw it back at you and I say the same question is we are challenged with internal to our own country. We have made rules that say you can favor absentee owners 
over local owners. You cannot treat them the same. Uh, yeah, I think a big issue is um, what you define as local. Uh, I've always seen like globalization is leading into uh, when you're going to discover maybe future civilizations or other civilizations other than ours. How is what you're saying here maybe going to sacrifice our position when another civilization is uh, discovered? And how another civilization meaning on another planet? Yes, uh -huh. if that if that's the case. Uh, well. Let me, let me throw that back at you. Don't, don't take the microphone away from him. Um, how, how, would, how would my position weaken us with respect to another civilization? Isolationism. Isolationism within our planet. No, you're talking about America. What else? What else? What else? What else? What Institute for Local Self-Reliance. I don't think that I posed a situation where you would be banned from buying something from Land's End. What I said was that we now have rules that say that you can impose a higher cost of doing business on your local businesses versus Land's End, but you can't even impose the same costs on Land's End. Now, unless you passed an amendment to the Constitution, Exactly, that dealt with the Commerce Clause, and I would love to engage people in a conversation about that. But one of the most important things that we need to overcome is this mindset. I mean, I understand what you're saying. The word isolationism is not what I'm talking about, but is a thing that pops up immediately. I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of an interesting thing. You know, we've changed our language in many ways. I mean, the word protection, you would think, would be a positive word. But when it comes to the economy, we think of it in a negative way. On the other hand, the word dependence, which we would think would be a negative word, when it comes to the economy, we think of it in a positive way. What I am proposing is that we have a global economy when it comes to information exchange. You create a good software program, and somebody in Japan can buy it from you. You want to have a conversation, a news service, a cultural exchange, music, whatever it turns out to be, in a global way. That brings us together as human beings. I don't think, and history, I think, demonstrates very well that when you sell me spice and I sell you cloth, we love each other, we understand each other, we work together, we have peace. There has been too many wars that have gone on among countries that were trading at very significant levels. But if we talk to each other, which is why I think this information system is extraordinary, we begin to understand. I wouldn't say it leads to world peace, but it does lead to a horizontal understanding that's much, that's extremely beneficial. But if I want to buy a car, it seems to me that the idea that the car would be made on six continents by one planetary corporation and embody several hundred thousand miles in its components and be sold to me as the ultimate consumer is a structure of the economy that creates much adverse impact. If we have to have it, if we have to have it, just as it seems to me we had to have U.S. steel at the end of the 19th century and we had to have large central power plants at the end of the 19th century. If we have to have it, okay. But why not create rules that try desperately
not to try to create a global economy in that way. And that's why I make the distinction between an economy based on information and an economy based on molecules or physical products. Uh, bringing it back down to sort of a local level, I've got a moral dilemma I hope you can help me with. If I go down to Mark and Dale's Apparel in Brockport, they have a wide selection of shoes, but they're all made in China. If I'm looking for sneakers, the only sneakers I've found that are, say they're made in the United States are sold by L.L. Bean. What should I do? Well, you know, if, if, you, if you read Adam Smith, the, uh, the godfather, the apostle of free trade, and I wish I could remember the, the exact words, but Adam Smith has a marvelous sort of section uh, in, his, uh, in his book, uh, which, which speaks to that issue. And he basically says, we cannot rely on the individual customer you know, to make purchases that benefit the social good. That you're, you, you, will, you will look for the cheapest. We all look for the cheapest. We would all like to save a few pennies and a few dollars. And so what we can do as a country is to begin to create rules that don't put you in that situation. Right now, we have rules that say you can go to China and make sneakers, shoes, with prison labor. You can make sneakers or shoes in a factory which doesn't even pay the local minimum wage. We don't, we could protest, we're not, we're not happy, we're not thrilled. If people want to start a boycott, that's okay. But the rules are such, the laws are such that that sneaker can come back into the United States. And with rules like that, you don't have US sneaker manufacturers. In fact, based on the rules that we've created in the last 25 years, we don't have US television manufacturers you know, any longer. I think Zenith was the last one, and they went to Mexico about three or four years ago. Um, so I am not asking you as, I mean, if you want to bear witness, you know, that would be good. And in fact, I am encouraging people to buy locally. But I am encouraging you to, to act more in your capacity as citizens than I am in your capacity as consumers. And that's a radical notion in the 1990s. It wasn't 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago. We thought of ourselves as citizens as well as consumers. But now the idea that we would exercise collective authority somehow smacks of socialism, it smacks of government, it smacks of all those things that we've rebelled against in the 1990s. But when we act as consumers, well, if we had to price people, watch, no, we're, we're Americans, right? Well, we can act as both. But it's the citizenship that we exercise that creates the rules under which we act as consumers and under which we act as investors. Other questions? You keep saying locally, buy locally, and stay local. But in this day of information technology and the internet and the World Wide Web, how do you define locally? I mean, like you say, Intel is going all over the place and Motorola and other companies like that. How do you define local in this day and age? Well, the question is, how do I, how do I define local in an age of, uh, of, uh, of internet? And I know that there are books that talk, that talk about the internet community. Uh, and in fact, the head of the MIT lab talks about the internet neighborhoods. Uh, and um, I don't deny that there's a certain sense of connectedness over the internet. But when you're robbed, when you run out of sugar, when you have a problem with your doctor, when you need someone to watch your house when you're leaving or to pick up your newspaper, you will not do that through the internet. And so I am talking about geographical community when I talk about local. Now, am I talking about your street, your house, your neighborhood, your city, 
your metropolitan area, your region. I'm talking about all of those things because in many ways all those things are interconnected. And what I would hope is that we could create rules which push authority and responsibility down to the lowest possible levels. I don't see any reason why you should have a regional government decide what you should do on your street. On the other hand, I don't think that you should decide in your neighborhood uh, what we do on a regional, uh, on a regional basis. Um, so I, I, I think that the, the idea that, to me, local in its most micro sense means how far you walk your dog. It used to mean where your kid went to school. Right? In a macro sense, it means where do you spend 90% of your life? And that's what I mean by local. Other questions? Well, we can continue this in the reception if you have, is, have questions for David Morris. And again, thank you all for staying and, and help me in thanking David Morris for a fine lecture. Thank you.